is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering high wizardry. Chapters, as usual, are unnumbered, but they are pattern recognition, uplink, and reserved words. In these chapters, Darren continues with this pattern of behavior in which she just decides to go ahead and try things. It's a personality trait I can't understand. I admire in a way, but I can't get it. And also Kit and Nita, who are on her tail at this point, almost get blown up by a supernova. Whoopsies. That was a close one. Uh, It's no big deal. He just killed a billions and billions of other beings potentially in the process welcome to spoil me Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Um, (laughs) Thank you so much to Tristan for commissioning this episode. This book, this whole series is really, really interesting and very different. And in that respect, I'm always excited to read more of any of the Young Wizard series. But this book in particular has been such a ride. I... And I just admire so much the depths of this author's imagination. And, you know, it's it's sort of funny. It's like, I always say that tropes are tropes for a reason. Tropes are tropes because they work, because they are getting at a core truth about things that we sort of understand and can relate to. And just because something is filled with tropes doesn't mean it's not good. It it can still be done really, really well. Um, the only reason that tropes can get sort of tired is when it feels like somebody just copy pasted from another source and didn't try to make it their own in any way. That said, there are a lot of books for Spoil Me and in general that I have been recommended to read that deal with magic in a pretty similar way. And that the way that magic works isn't even exactly what I mean, because every book that I'm covering right now, we've got this world in which magic is something that you like write out or use a computer to like put in code. We have Lyriel and Sabriel where the magic is like charter marks that are runes that like imbue objects and things that have been enchanted. There are... There's magic in the Trudy Canavan series where there's a sort of force inside you that you can feel and mind reading that's like being inside of a different building when it's actually somebody's mind. There are a lot of various ways that actual magic can be handled, but oftentimes there is a overall trope of um, magic that is regulated by some sort of high council, kind of, right? Even Dresden Files, which I love, still operates by this. And there are people like keeping an eye on whether or not you're breaking any laws. There are things that you just do not do and we all understand are kind of like a taboo. There are a lot of like you know, good and bad magic sort of dichotomies. And in this book, it's really interesting because what she has done is managed to still get across the idea that there is a watchdog sort of group of people, but they're so uninvolved that it doesn't feel that like institutionalized in the same way that it does in other books. So, you know, we have Nita and she gets the, the book of wizardry in her way in a library, but 
it's not as, like in the other books I'm covering, if there was a way that you receive your magic, pretty much everybody gets it in the same way. It reveals itself in similar explosions of like, oh, I lost control of myself and I don't, uh, I didn't realize I had this power, but here it is. What a surprise that is. Um, and in instead, she's like, oh, no, well, this is how she finds it. And it's something that she has to agree to. It's in her. It, the potential is there, but it doesn't become activated until she decides to, like, take this on. And then her sister similarly has to, like, accept it, but does not receive that basically that proposition in the same way. It's a computer. It's a whole other thing. So the way that this magic is very adapted and suited to whomever it's interacting with is itself very different. And then, you know, we have uh, Carl and, and what's his face who are the adapted, adult wizards in their world, the ones that they have contact with and whom they have personally gotten to know. But there's nothing about them that feels like they really represent a body of essentially like disciplinarians, people who like regulate and keep track of how magic is done. They're more there as guidance and help, but they are not meant to be authority figures in the way that I often think of them in stories about magic, where they tell you this and this are not done. And here are books to study. And here is things to do. Like the, the magic is its own entity in this book and reveals itself. And then you are set off on these ordeals to discover what you are capable of. And you are really sort of left to your own devices. The people who care about you, like in this case for Doreen, her sister, Kit, and, you know, Pichu, in this case, um, they are, of course, following after her and trying to help her. But Doreen, like, set off without so much as a word. There was no indicator that this was going to happen. There was nothing reaching out making like drawing her into this so much as she decided she wanted to do something. And so she went and that whole vibe feels very different to me because I think that there is a tendency that we aren't even really aware of as human beings. When we want to write about magic, we want to write about it almost as if it is a God of some kind that is like, if infallible or at the very least like aware of what I'm trying to figure out the way to say this that that it has sort of knowledge of us and is a like has an awareness of everything that is happening at a given time in the world and whenever human beings access it they're like dipping into a little fraction of it, but there's like a vast ocean of that magic and they're just accessing a little bit of it. That's the the feel that I get a lot of times. In this story, it doesn't feel that way to me. It feels more like the magic is a friend hanging out with them. Kind of like, oh, you want to do that? I mean... I guess. Yeah, we could try that. Let's see what happens. Like the magic doesn't seem to be uh, itself an authority figure, something that like decides, no, 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 we're not letting you do that. It's more like interested to see what you're going to do. Like it's also unaware of its own potential and you are the one deciding how it's going to explore itself. Like it's at your mercy versus you being at its mercy. And there's just a, an extremely different atmosphere and tone and attitude towards magic in this book than almost anything else that I have read. I find it extremely interesting and more amusing, I think, because of how different this is. Um, so let's start off chapter, well, the first chapter in this section. Again, they're not numbered. Why? Why don't you just number them? Oh, my God. But it's not. 
Um, it starts off with Nita appearing on the moon. And she's by herself for a while. She has to, like, draw the others towards her by writing the marks on the ground. Um, and she is kind of, like, contemplating the overall situation that she's in. So, first of all, um, she pulled her manual out and started paging through it for the tracker spell that she and Kit would need when he got here. It was actually a variant of the one he had threatened to put on Darien in the city. This one hunted for the char characteristic charged string residue left in space by the passage of a wizard's transit spell through it. Nita's specialty was astronomy, so she had been shocked to find that empty space wasn't actually empty. And even the hardest vacuum had in it what physicists called strings, lines of potential force that have nothing to do with most of the forces physicists understand. Wizards, of course, could use them. Much of what passes for telekinesis turns out, in fact, to be string manipulation. The tracker spell made most elegant use of it. And once we find her, Nita thought, I'm going to tie a few of those strings around her neck. But it didn't do to start a wizardry in such a mood. Um, so, yeah, she draws this diagram on the ground. And this is fun. The... Uh, the basic circle knotted with the wizard's knot, her own personal data reduced by now after much practice to one long scrawl in the precise and elegant shorthand version of the speech. Kit's data, another scrawl over which she took even more care than her own. What a wizard names in the speech is defined so. Inaccurate naming can alter the nature of the named, and Nita liked Kit just the way he was. A third long scrawl of shorthand for Pichu. Nita looked oddly at some of the variables in it, but Tom had given her the data, and he certainly knew what he was doing. Then the internal diagrams, the intent factors, the point of origin, the intended point of arrival or vector of travel, the desired result, the time parameters, and conditional statements for life support, the balloon diagram for the ethical argument. So when I was talking about the difference in magics before part of where that comes from is the fact that it's simply different to access and use for everybody. Um, Nita is writing the speech here. Darine has her computer and the way that this manifests is very different versus something like, for example, in the, um, the series, and I'm not exactly sure what the overall series is called, but the ones with Lyriel, Sabriel, um, in that, Many, many different people use magic, but most of them tend to use magic in really similar ways. You can enchant something to, like, be basically secured against the wrong person opening it. You can enchant something to look like a person and be a servant in a way, but it is just simply a, you know, composite of magic. It's a, a lot of similar spells or similar methods being repeated over and over again. And here we see something that, like, sure... Nita and Kit use pretty similar magics amongst the two of them, but Darreen is proof of how differently that works for her. And I can't imagine what other methods of magic we'll see in other books, because this is a pretty big series, right? So um, we have this moment, too, where Nita is hearing this hiss in the background. And this is something that... um. Darine had even mentioned in her section. It says uh, that she, she, at first it's like the feeling of maybe it's the wind because there's like, it, it flies around. There's not heavy gravity on the moon, but she realizes soon that it is actually the uh, remnants of the big bang. And we had talked about that before. Um, Normally, only radio telescopes set to the right frequency could hear it, but Nita wasn't normal, nor was the sound just a sound to her. In it, she could hear the sound of consciousness, life, as plainly as she had used to be able to hear Kit think. That sensitivity had decreased over time, but this one was increasing. It seemed in the deep silence, by the minute, it upset her. Suddenly, the universe, which had seemed so empty, now felt crammed full of powers and intelligence that might not need planets or bodies. And Darreen was out there in the middle of them, mucking around in her inimitable fashion. Nita found herself wishing that Kit would hurry up. She very much wanted to see that cheerful face. 
to hear at least his voice, if not his sassy, loud cast of thought, always with that slight Hispanic accent to it. Long time since we heard each other think. She had been wondering about that. So this is really interesting. Um, she and Kit had been able to hear each other's thoughts very, very easily initially. And she is starting to feel like she's grown closer to him in a lot of ways. But they are not able to hear each other the way they had used to. And she doesn't really understand this. Um, and she gets to this part in the book and it tells her, Wizards in the closest relationships leading toward permanent partnership usually find that nonverbal communication becomes rare or difficult. Other conditions obtain for other species, but for human wizards, intimacy is meaningless without barriers to overcome and to lower. Wizards usually have little need for such in the early stages of their careers, but as the situation changes, as the wizard becomes more adept at accurate description in the speech and therefore more adept at evaluating the people he or she works with, the wizard's mind typically adapts to the new requirements by gradually shutting out the person most. And she cuts it off there and thinks about it saying permanent partnership. And she, of course, assumes that what this means is marriage. And she gets really defensive mentally about this. Like it's one of those things that um, as an adult, it seems sort of silly to me because I know now that, you know, permanent partnership does not necessarily mean marriage. There are so many people that you can be friends with and, and be of whatever gender you are physically attracted to. And yet that is not there between the two of you. That's not necessarily the way it is. And so her assumption that it means marriage is just a really kind of sweet and very immature reaction that she obviously can't really see any other way until Kit says something later about just being friends forever. Um, and she sits thinking about the fact that all of the people like at school, all of the girls are really starting to get into boys and starting to date and starting to like, uh, you know, probably become sexually active soon. And she is not in that headspace at all. And she doesn't understand why she doesn't care about that. She feels kind of judgmental towards herself for this simply not being very important to her and um, wonders like if she's even normal. And there are so many different reasons that something like this could happen. I mean, hormones are at the root of our attraction to people. So it could just be that she has not reached a physical point in her development as a person where hormones are being released. And that it doesn't interest her yet because she's just a little bit behind the others. It could be that she's asexual. You know, that's a thing people, some people just do not care about sex and it's just not something that like interests them at all. It could be because she says at one point, for one thing, she was too busy. And while that sounds like an excuse, that can really happen where you are just so preoccupied with so many other things in life that worrying about a romantic relationship is literally the last fucking thing on your mind. And like saying I'm too busy often sounds like, well, what, you're just working so much. But Nita's literally out here saving the world multiple times. So if anybody gets to say they're maybe too busy for a relationship, I would say it's her. Um and she says, look at Tom and Carl. They're just buddies. They just work together because they enjoy doing it. Guys, I had been out here operating under Tom and Carl being romantically involved. Is this her misunderstanding their relationship? Or is this the writer backing off of her making them a gay couple and deciding that she just wants them to be like roommates or something? I really assume that it's just Nita not understanding their relationship. But I feel a little bummed out if that's the case, you know, because I want her to be aware that that's the relationship these guys have with each other. Um, so anyway, she says to herself, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with having a best friend? And she says, he's a boy. That's what it's changing. I'm changing. I'm scared. Has he noticed this happening to him too? And suppose he starts liking someone else better than me. Will they want to keep the team going? If only I knew what he was thinking. It's probably nothing. Everything is probably fine. Um, so 
there is like, uh, uh, I mean, it's understandable when you're this young, especially in this particular instance. And I, I'm curious if there's any listeners out there who had a friendship that developed from them being children together to being teens. If you ran across this or if the feeling of being friends from before any of this was actually a, an issue maintains itself and you just don't really find yourself particularly looking at them that way. I'm sure it's different for different people. Um, but, you know, I wonder the the paranoia, I will call it, even though that's kind of overstating things that she has about this. It's understandable when he's the only friend that she has at the moment that we know of that she's like particularly close to the only one other than Doreen and her parents that's like on the inside of the magic thing. Um, there are a lot of reasons why being drawn to him, even in romantic capacity would be understandable. But anyway, so Tom comes through first, he's got a uh, peach on his shoulder and he says, Kit just called me. He'll be up in a few. He's settling things with his folks. Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting that we don't actually see how they react. We just kind of hear from Kit that they freaked out. And it turns out like his dad is pretty proud of him and his mother barely said anything. Um, but I, you know, it's been pretty clear that Nita is the main character of these books more so than Kit. Uh, but I did still kind of think that we might get a look at that. So I was a bit sad that we didn't at the same time, how differently can you write that scene? Um, so Tom says, I wanted to see you two off up here because there's data you'll need that your parents don't. Something major is going on out there. Doreen is not going to run into just some bunch of lackeys for the lone power out there. That one itself is after her, but I have no indication why. And its power is oddly veiled at the moment, concentrated and hidden. I don't think this manifestation of the lone power is going to be as obvious as others have been recently. So find Irene and look carefully at the situation. If it looks like she needs to be where she is, stay with her and do what you can for her. But you're going to have to be very careful. The lone one won't mind distracting her by striking at you two or using her danger to sucker you into pulling her out of the problem she's intended to correct. Use your judgment. Save her if you can. And if we can't, Kit said. Tom looked at him sadly. See that the job gets done, whatever it is. There's no telling what the stakes are on this one. The looks of the situation may be deceiving, probably will. Can you take this job and do it? Don't go if you can't. If either of you isn't sure you can depend on yourself or on the both of you, I don't want you to do this. Too much can go wrong. And uh, they just are like, no, we're absolutely going to do this. Um, so he tells them, Carl and I have sent word ahead through the network so that a lot of people will be expecting you. You're going to find the way wizards have to behave on Earth is the exception rather than the rule. Most of the major law enforcement bodies in this part of the galaxy routinely call wizards in for consultations, and they owe us a lot of favors. So don't be afraid to ask the authorities wherever you go for help. Odds are you'll get it. So get out of here and good hunting. Um, and... Pichu says goodbye, like nibbles on his, uh, on his, or what is it? She was reach up to nibble his ear. That's it. Um, and then they head out and we cut back to the chapter titled Uplink, which is with Daring. This is just so daring. You know, this is daring in a way that I don't understand all of the implications of it. And I am shocked that Doreen is willing to do it. I mean, I'm not shocked because it's, she's proven time and time again, that she's far more willing to take risks than a lot of people, but it's, I don't really, I guess what it is, is that I don't understand exactly what her objective is. So it's continuing to do the, this like list of ones, which is not, making any sense to her. And she assumes that she has done something to destroy her computer, like potentially ruin her, you know, her magic essentially. Um, 
And she says, what's wrong with you? Diagnostic. External input, said the computer. Non-typical. What is it? Some kind of broadcast? Negative. Local. It happened right after I linked to the geothermal power, Daring thought. Check your link to the planet, she said. Affirmative. Positive identification. External input. Planetary source. Are there people here? Negative. Can you get rid of all of those ones? Affirmative. The screen steadied down to the last page she'd been looking at. Darreen stared at it. This unique structure becomes, and this is like the text that she'd been reading, this unique structure becomes more interesting when considering the physical nature of the layering. Some 92% of the layers consist of chemically pure silicon, predisposing the aggregate to electroconductive activity in the presence of light or under certain other conditions. This effect is likely to be enhanced in some areas by the tendency of silicon to superconduct at surface temperatures below 200 degrees Kelvin. There is also a possibility that semi-organic life of a monocellular nature will have arisen in symbiosis either with the silicon layers or their associated doping layers producing. And she realizes that there is something alive with like within this silicon, that the silicon itself is essentially a conducting computer chip and that she can communicate with the actual planet somehow. Um, so she is sending signals initially. Um, and she says, some, uh, how had this chip been laying itself down in the silence? She wondered. Volcanoes erupted chemically, pure silicon, and trace elements that glazed themselves into vast reaches of chip surface as soon as they touched the planet. And farther down in the molten warmth of the planet's own geothermal heat, the little silicon-based bacteria that had wound themselves together out of some kind of an analog to DNA. Maybe they were more like amoebas than bacteria now, etching their way along through the layers of silicon and cadmium and other elements, getting their food, their energy, from breaking the compound's chemical bonds, the same way carbon-based life gets it from breaking down complex proteins into simpler ones. It was likely enough. Um, the chip was awake with this much surface area. How could it not have woken up? But there was no way that she could see for it to get data. No way for it to contact the outside world. It's trapped. The ones, basic binary code for on, used by all computers from the simplest to the most complex, were a scream for help. A sudden realization that something else existed in the world and a crying out to it. Even as she looked down at the screen and watched what the computer was doing, the streams of ones became a little less frantic. One, 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 said her own machine. One, 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 said the planet. Give it an arithmetic series, Darien whispered. So it starts to go in patterns. She says, try geometric, uh, try square. It's hard to tell if it's just repeating. Um, and she tries it with binary, adding zeros. And things start to like, you know, and Darien is like watching it realizing that she's essentially teaching this consciousness that's existing in the silicon how to communicate from scratch. And she compares this to like, uh, to Helen Keller with no ability to speak or to hear um, or to see, but at least Helen Keller had the ability to feel so she could you know, feel the texture of the water on her hand and then feel the impact of the, uh, you know, sim signal that is drawn into her hand of what water is. And she's trying to figure out how she can get past an obstacle like this with a thing that does not have any sort of context for anything. And um, she asks the computer if it can hook it into her, its sent sensors. Um, and it says high probability of causing damage to the corresponding computer due to too great a level of complexity. And Doreen is kind of like, fuck, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, no. And then she says, can you hook me to it? This time the hesitation was even longer. And Doreen stared at the computer, half expecting it to make an expression at her. It didn't, but the speech of its response was slow affirmative, it said. 
Triple confirmation of intent required. I tell you three times, Darien said. Hook it to me. Tell me what to do. It has got uh, it has got to get some better idea of what's going on out here or it will go crazy. Direct physical contact with surface, the computer said. It sounded reluctant. Darien dusted her hands off and put them flat on the glassy ground. She was about to open her mouth to tell the computer to go ahead to do what it was going to do, but she never got the chance. The instantaneous jolt went right through her with exactly the same painless grabbing and shaking she had felt when she was seven and had put a bobby pin in the electric socket. So she suddenly gets like jammed into a sort of symbiotic communication for a moment where she can hear the computer crying one one zero zero one zero zero one zero one 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 um and there and she, it says the reply she heard that too a long crazed string of binary that made no sense to her but needed to make none joy it was simply joy joy at discovering meaning joy so intense that all her muscles jumped in reaction breaking her out of the connection and flinging her face down on the glazed ground the connection re-established itself and Doreen's mind fell down into turmoil she couldn't think straight caught between the two computers for under the swift tutelage of her own the great glassy plane was now beginning truly to function as one she felt the contents of her brain being twinned and the extra copy dumped out into endless empty memory and stored in a rush of images, ideas, occurrences, communications, theories, and raw sensations. She knew it only took a short time, but it seemed to go on forever, and all her senses throbbed like aching teeth at being desperately and delightedly used and used and used and used again to sense this moment, this ever-changing now. Darene thought she would never perceive anything as completely again as she was seeing and feeling the green and gold shaded piece of silicon aggregate she laid on, with the four crumbs from her sandwich lying half an inch from her eye. She felt sure she would be able to describe the shape of those crumbs and the precise pattern of the dappling in the silicon of her on her deathbed, if she survived this to have one. Finally, it stopped. How is it? Doreen said. Considerably augmented, said the computer. Is it just me, she said, or do you sound smarter than you have been? Um, are you expanding your syntax to include mine? You got it, said the computer. Doreen took a moment to sit up. Before this, she thought she would love having the computer to be a little bit more flexible. Now she was having second thoughts. How's our friend doing? assimilating the new data and self-programming it present its present running state has analogs to trance or dream states in humans and at this point she makes a call that is really quite insane <laughs> um update said the computer it is requesting more data on what no specific request. It simply desires more. I'm fresh out, Darien said and yawned. Then she looked at the computer again. No, I'm not. Give it what you've got. Repeat and clarify, said the computer, sounding slightly unnerved. Give it what you've got, all the information about planets and species and history and all the rest of it. Give it the magic. The computer said nothing. Darien sat up straight. Go on, she said. No reply. Is there some rule that says you shouldn't? Yes, said the computer slowly. But this edition of the software contains the authorization override function. Good, Doreen said. None too sure of what this meant, except that it sounded promising. Girl, what are you doing? I'm overriding. Give it what you've got. The screen blanked then filled with another brief stream of binary that blanked in turn. Um, so she is... She, she's thinking about how tired she is, goes off and walks away while leaving the computer to do its thing, and she turns around, and she sees that, the, that a certain patch 
of the silicon surface is moving around. Um, and the cr crust cracked upward in jagged pieces, and the something underneath pushed through, up, and out. Bits of silica glass fell slowly in the light gravity and bounced or shattered in a snow of splinters around the rounded shape that stood there. Stood was the right word, for it had legs, those short, stumpy ones, as if a toy tank had thrown its treads and, ground, and grown limbs itself. It shook itself, the rounded, glassy, glittering thing, and walked over to Doreen and threw her shields with a gait like a centipede's or a clockwork toy's. And it looked up at her, if something like a turtle with no head can be said to look up. Light, it croaked, in a passable imitation of the computer's voice, and bumped against her shin and rested there. And Doreen basically kind of has a bit of a meltdown. And she's like, oh my god, I can't do this. And she sits down and she winds up just like falling asleep. She did not see, an hour and a half later, when the sun at its meridian began to pucker and twist out of shape and for the best part of the hour lost half of itself and shone only feebly, warped and dimmed. Her companion saw it and said to the computer, What? Darkness, said the computer, and nothing more. Well, what the fuck is that? Like, that is some unnerving shit. First of all, this bitch just gave an entire planet magic. I do not know why her edition of the software contains the override. I am trying to be hopeful that it's because this was what she was supposed to do. But it does feel like an incredibly presumptuous thing to do. Um, low key, what happened here was like, get Adam and Eve eating the apple, right? Like she just gave something consciousness and information and understanding. And I don't know if this creature that comes out of the silicon existed already, but I have to assume it does not. Um, and that it was formed in response to receiving the data that she gave it. And I am just dying to know what this thing continues to do and be like, because it could go in so many directions. It could be something that sort of protects her. It could be something that protects her while still learning. It could be something that, because I'm assuming I'm operating under the assumption that she is going to continue to have this thing by her side, that she isn't going to, uh, you know, leave this planet and leave it there. I feel like she's going to feel some sort of responsibility for it. Um, and, I don't know if there are others, if it's just this this planet was only really capable of the creation of one of these creatures, if it's working on more, or if this one is all it's really interested in, in creating at this time. No idea. But this just raises so many questions. Um, so then the last chapter in this section is called Reserved Words. And Nit, Kita, uh, Kita and Nit, Nita and Kit... Um, they wind up at the same alien airport, essentially, that <laughs> that Doreen had been at and uh, caused such a ruckus at. And it's really kind of fun because they get to see what a complete mess she left. Of course, they don't really know exactly what's happening here yet. So there is a bit of an assumption being made that she is a so inexperienced at traveling like this and so reckless that she just caused all of these problems via her own behavior. But it starts to become really clear that the lone one was after her from the start, that she had to be on the defensive immediately. And this, all of this damage that was caused to this building and everything was not her fault. This was not something that she like, you know, just impulsively caused. Um, so they have to go and they're, and they're talking to Peach who gets a sense of things, right? That's why Peach is with them. Um, and they are trying to find the station master. Um, and it's out in the very middle 
of this airport, uh, there's a little bit of a history thing about how this used to be just like a, a straw hut and a cave, but turned into this whole other thing with the advents of technology. Um, but I won't get into that too much. And this creature is there that looks kind of like a centipede. Um, it's called rear height, rear height. Um, we are on errantry and we greet you. Nita said the standard self introduction of a wizard on business. Um, it's about time you people got here, said the master, and left off what it was doing, standing up. We had more of an untidiness here this afternoon than we had for a great year past, and I'll be glad to see the end of it. Nita began to sweat. The wizard who came through here was on ordeal, Kit said. We need your help to find the spot from which she went farther on so that we can track her. There are too many other world gates here, and they're confusing the trail. At this point... Nita says she didn't cause any trouble, did she? And I love how this goes. So she says this. The station master says trouble. Led, leads them over to show where parts of the ceiling have like been shot down by blasters. Uh, then there's kiosks that have been overturned and covered in blaster marks. Um <laughs> The large cordoned off area where maintenance people of various species were scraping and scrubbing coffee ground smelling residue off the floor. Oh, no trouble. Not really. Pichu began to laugh, a wicked and appreciative sound. Oh, Pichu, never change. Honestly, Pichu is very amusing to me. Like, I keep loving Pichu's, like, weird combination of being very invested and also being sort of outside of everything um it makes for an interesting approach and and perspective i guess um so finally this this uh station master leads them to the essentially the like surveillance camera footage um and it's in three dimensions and it says they watched a group of toad-like BEMs make their way across the terminal floor, spot Darreen, and head off in pursuit. They watched Darreen deal with the uh, Di Dinonicus and afterward with the BEM that grabbed her. Nina gulped. They look like Satrachi, Kit said, astonishingly cool-voiced. Nina's eyebrows went up. So she's, like, herself been studying alien species but she's realizing that kit has also done some homework here i really like that detail because it emphasizes that kit is like serious about this mission we know that he is but he is approaching this like it's his own little sister that's missing you know like just doing that extra work and i really appreciate that um so there's one of them um one of these bems which is called uh Satrachi, Sotrach I think, um, that they were able to capture that has proper identification. And uh, she says that she wants to go and talk to it. And meanwhile, because she's the one, again, that deals with living things while Kit deals with like machinery and inanimate objects. So she's going to go and talk to this living creature that was meant to like find her sister and kill her while Kit goes into the bathroom from which Darreen disappeared and is going to try and sense from the residual energy on the walls of this room and on the objects like the, uh, you know, like the door handles, which we have experienced before. Um, and he is supposed to try and pick up what he can from that, which is just such a cool idea. Like I know that we have talked before about the interesting differences between their two magics. The fact that she is dealing with um, living things and that he has the inanimate stuff, but this is another like point to favor what I was talking about earlier, um, which is like off oftentimes when we talk about magic in fantasy, it's often based on elements, right? It's often based on things that are like already occurring and would be here even if man were not here. It's sort of taken for granted that the 
magic is an uh, a force that we can all have our different strengths in. Um, but those strengths tend to be elementally based. So it's like, oh, he's better with fire magic or they are better with, you know, some things like this. And this is a very different take on it. Better with living things, better with non-living things. Extremely different. Um, and non-living things, not in, not like when you normally say that in fantasy, it means undead things. But this is, that's not what that means here, you know? Um, so she goes and sees the Satra, but doesn't actually really get anything valuable in terms of information. She realizes that it was a dupe that was deluded into pursuing her for some like other reason than what they thought. Um, and she says the power never comes out in the open. If it can find some way to make someone else do its dirty work, preferably an innocent that way, it's more of a slap in the, in the face of the bright powers face. Unusual, though, that it used a whole group this time. Normally, it's hard to keep that subtle a grip on a whole group's mind. One of them slips free or perceives it as control. And when that happens, odds are the whole group is useless for its purposes. So this is the first hint that we get based on what she's telling us, the, how the lone one normally operates that it is really kind of pulling out all the stops in terms of trying to stop whatever it is that Darien's doing. Um, so she goes and meets up with Kit and Pichu and the station master, and she sees all of the blaster marks against the back of the wall. And of course, assumes that her sister got like shot up and Kit tries to be like, there's no blood or anything. And she's like, yeah, she was shot with blasters. There wouldn't be blood because they cauterized the wounds. And he's like, even if they did cauterize, there's no way that they just evaporate blood in midair. Like there would be some kinds of spatters. There would be something. Um, and he says, and the tiles don't remember her screaming. And, you know, she may be kind of tough for her age, but there's no way she gets shot and is spurting blood or, you know, whatever and doesn't scream. Um, th that computer she's got leaves a definite sense of what it's been doing behind it. Can you feel it? Um, some residue of Doreen's emotion still hung about the strings in the space-time configuration like tatters on a barbed wire fence. Fear and defiance all tangled up together and alongside her tatters, others, ordered and regular, a weave less vivid and complex in different ways. It feels alive, Nita said. Do computers usually feel that way? I don't know, Kit said, sounding annoyed. I never tried feeling one before this. Um, we're going to need to catch up with her and her friends. So the master leaves them alone, the station master. And um, they are heading out, right? They're they're heading to the Satran uh, planet, I guess, in order to try and question some people and get more information about what it was they thought they were doing and what could be going on here. Um, they head over there and it's a really like frightening moment, to be honest. When I read this, I felt my heart rate increase. Um, so we have, a, first of all, before we leave, Pichu is talking to them um, and they're, you know, putting down the symbols for the transit. And Pichu's like, get mine right. I don't want to come out of the other side of the transit in fur. Um, and Kit, like, does the all of the writing and then stands back and lets Pichu, like, take a look over it and be like, how does this look? Does this seem right to you? And does it seem like something bad is going to happen? To which Pichu's like, dude, your, sis or your uh, friend's sister is on ordeal. And you're jumping from planet to planet to try and find her. Of course, something bad is going to happen to you, buddy. Like, it's just, just don't even ask me that question. Um, and he says that the power that invented death is going to be on your tail shortly. Even if you two should, even you two should be able to see that com coming. Um, so Nita starts talking here about, how, yeah, this creature invented death, but the death itself wasn't really enough. Like, it needed people to be afraid of death. And Kit's like, yeah, and that seems to not really be uh, 
like the re like the way that we operate anymore. It's not like we're not still scared to die, but we have a lot of theories about why maybe it's not such a bad thing. And the hold that he has is not complete anymore. Um, and she says, I know Kit, do you think Tom said something was about to tip over some major change? Do you think what he meant was that the lone one was about to lose completely somewhere? He's always said that what happens one place spreads every place else. Kit said, um, so if it's somewhere or other, it's about to lose right from the start. Nita looked at him sideways. Then it starts losing at home, too, in all the little daily battles, eventually. Somehow, her sister had a chance of actually defeating the lone power. She must have a chance. It wouldn't be wasting energy on her otherwise. Um, I, the lone power has been pulling this kind of stunt on planets for as long as intelligence has been evolving. It comes in, it tries to get people to accept entropy willingly, and then it bungs off and leaves them to make themselves more miserable than it could do if it worked at it. But all of a sudden, it can be beaten? How come? Pichu began chewing on Kit's top button. You know, she said, that's part of the answer. Granted, it's immortal, but it doesn't have infinite power. It's pure to all the powers, but not to that in which they move. And even an immortal can get tired. Um, so after all these near losses, it's tired enough to be beaten outright? Of course, it was that tired long ago. The powers wouldn't need Doreen for just that. They could do it themselves or with the help of older wizards. But haven't you got it through your head? They can't want to just beat the lone one. They must think there's a better option. Nita looked at Pichu, feeling half frightened. They want it to surrender, she said. I think so, said Pichu. So this is pretty interesting. They want, they don't want to like beat it. They want it to give itself up, which is a whole other beast and really a lot more difficult in my mind. There's, I mean, you know, giving itself up would mean that it would have to have an awareness that it has lost and mean that it is willing to completely give up on what it has been fighting for for millennia, you know? Pfft, that feels unlikely. I don't know. Oh, Devin's here. I made it so late. Stupid allergies kicking my ass. I'm sorry, Devin, but welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm so close to done, too. What a shame. But you can listen to it later. Um... So Kit tell, tells a story, a particularly horrible story about Northern Ireland. Um, and he says on various sides, they hijack cars. And after using them for whatever they're doing, they set fire to them. And recently one of them did that, but there was a dog trapped inside the car and they lit the car on fire with the dog in it. And he says, Bad enough that they kill children and grown-ups and don't even care. But the poor dogs, too. If we really have any chance to stop that kind of thing, I'll do whatever. I don't care. Anything. She looked at him. Anything? Yeah. Eventually, she nodded. Me, too. I know. She looked at him in surprise. Well, look at what you did with the whales, he said. Which is true. You know, she's acting like she's making this huge, like, statement by being like, I'll do anything. And it's like you were just willing to die, literally, for a, you know, what do you call it? Ritual. So, yeah, we are aware, girl, that you are willing to die for the thing that you believe in. Like, that's not a shock. And he says, you almost got yourself killed. You knew what might happen and you did it anyway. I know you did it for me some. He said this as if it were unimportant. I was in trouble. You got me out of it. But mostly you did it to have things in the world be safe and work. Kit, she said. Look, I didn't do it for you some. I did it for you pretty much. Kit looked at her with an expression that at first made you to think Kit thought she was angry with him. But then it became plain that he was embarrassed too. Well... He said, okay, I thought maybe you did, but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't know for sure. And I would have felt real stupid if I was wrong. 
And she says, I like you a lot. And if you start liking somebody that much, well, I want to keep the team going. If, if you do, that's all. Neats, cut me some slack. You're my best friend. I thought it was Richie Sussman. Kit shrugged. We just play pool a lot, but it's the truth. Isn't it true for you? Yeah, but so why does that have to change? Look, we've got junk to do. Let's shake on it. We'll be best friends forever and a team. He said it so casually, but then that was how Kit was. That was how he did things. The only thing that wasn't casual was the way he worked to do what he said he would. What if something happens? Look, he said, something always happens. You still have to promise stuff anyway. If you have to work to make the promise true, it's like a spell. You have to say the words every time you want the results. Neats, come on, shake on it. They shook on it. Nita felt oddly light, as if her knapsack had been full of rocks and someone had come up behind her and dumped them out. So, that's a really sweet moment. And I like that this, like, is being addressed between the two of them. This feeling of things changing between them. You know, they're growing. They're, they're not adults by any means, but they're starting to have to deal with the adult implications of their relationship and they have to decide whether or not they are going to let that determine how they behave towards one another and whether they are willing to like, you know, be, be cool and not let that get in the way of being a team and of continuing to do this really important work together. And, uh, I just really like him saying like, basically what's a promise worth if the minute something happens it just gets thrown out the window. That's the whole reason promises are important is because you continue to make them be a promise. And that's a really cool way of saying this. Um, so they got, they, they get in the circle and they head out and uh, there was a long, long darkness between the world winking out and flashing back into existence again. Nita could never remember it's having taken so long before, but then the jump from Earth to Rirath had been a short one. She held her breath and maintained control, even while the back of her brain was screaming frantically. He made a mistake in the spell somewhere. You distracted him. He misspelled something else. You're stuck in this and he'll never get out. So they finally get out and things seem to be okay. Um, and they're looking around. There's this like, uh, it says unfamiliar stars in the flaming motionless curtain of an emission nebula flung across the darkness, like a transparent gauze, um, amidst a clutter of equipment and portable shelters, there stood a small crowd of Satrachi and Nita starts to say, all right, let's do this. Cause they're going to go over there and talk to them. And Pichu screams, move us, do it now. Guys, when I tell you that I had the literary, literary equivalent of me hitting the ceiling reading this, Pichu is just so, so offhanded and so sort of dismissive so much of the time that Pichu reacting this way, like, really fucked me up. It, like, just, I don't like it. So... Kit is starting to like change the coordinates and, and redo the spell. And Peach is like, that is not far enough. Meanwhile, Nita uh, ties up the gimbal on the ground into her shield spell. Can it take the strain of two spells at once? We'll find out. It'll abort the one it can't manage anyway. Um, and she starts putting in the, uh, basically the code for, physical forces, naming every force in the universe that she could think of, trying their names on her shield and forbidding them entrance. Can I pull this off? Is this one of the spells that have a limit on the number of added variables? Oh, Lord, I hope not. Light, Peach was screaming at her. Light, light. Nita told the shield to be opaque, then wondered why it wasn't, as the brightest light she had ever imagined came in through it anyway. She had to, she had been to a shuttle launch, launch once and had come to understand that sound could be a force, a thing that grabbed you from inside your chest and shook you effortlessly back and forth. 
Now she wondered how she had never thought that light might be able to do the same under some circumstances. It struck her deaf and dumb and blind, and she went sprawling. Heat scorched her everywhere. She smelled the rotten egg stink of burning hair. She clutched the gimbal. She couldn't have dropped it if she tried. Much later, it seemed, it began to get dark. She opened her eyes and could not be sure for a few minutes that they were open. The world was so full of afterimages. But the purple curtain between her and everything else eventually went away. She and Kit and Peach were hanging suspended, weightless, in empty space. At least it was empty now. There was no sign of any moonlit. Only off to one side, a blinding star that slowly grew and grew and grew towards them. They were out of its range now. They had not been before. Uh, so where are we? Haven't the faintest somewhere a light month out from our original position, and those Satrachi were bait, he said, for us. Look at it, Neats. She looked. I could have sworn I opaqued this shield. It is opaqued, Kit said. But a shield doesn't usually have to put up with a nova at close range. H-bombs are about the most one can block out without leakage, if I remember. So she's staring... At a supernova that this lone power basically set off just to kill these three. Did this system have other planets? I don't know. I doubt it cared. And this was what was going after her little sister. The anger in Nita got very, very cold. Let's go find her, she said. Together... They began to read. So, yeah, this is a being willing to kill how many planets, potentially? How many billions of beings in a solar system? Loud. This ain't fucking around, kids. So, with that very astute observation, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm over time a little bit. But... Thank you very, very much to Tristan for commissioning this episode. Um, and Devin and Hugabugger showed up so late in the chat. I missed you guys, but hopefully next time. And thank you all so much for listening. Hope you're enjoying it. Until next time. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.